Hi, everybody. So I'll tell you just a little bit about fantasy itself. Of course, I talk about this a lot in, in um, you know, the sexuality courses that I do, just to give a kind of meaning frame to understand fantasy, because it's fundamentally challenging for us, because if we take seriously the idea of, you know, as a man thinketh, so is he, we may think, well, I'm really toast then. Of course, I always point out at the Art of Desire retreat that um, that's as a man thinketh. So um, so we, we females, we're fine. <laughs> uh, we can think of anything we want. <laughs> Sexual thought is odd, to say the least. It's strange. And a lot of us have the idea that the fact that our erotic thoughts are so counter to convention, uh, illegal sometimes, uh, completely the opposite of what we might want in the light of day in our lives and in our marriages, that it can make us feel very strange. I mean, I, I think this is one of the reasons why sexuality is such a hard topic for human beings to handle is because it's so um, counter to any idea of what would be um, good and polite things to think. So somebody I think quoted me recently um, in the, one of the Facebook groups <laughs> saying something like, we should have garnish our thoughts and have them be good and wise, except for in the bedroom. <laughs> um, and I think this is, you know, as I have, you probably have heard me talk about is that sexuality is a kind of grown up play. And part of play is trying on meanings. When we move into the realm of the sexual or the erotic, we're looking for ways to increase psychological and physical stimulation. And so becoming physically aroused feels good, uh, meaning we, that's essential to, to sexual functioning and we need it. But then we also need psychological stimulation. And so for many of us, this is to move into ideas or thoughts that create more psychological tension or stimulation. One of the ways we do this is that our minds go into, um, how to say it, high anxiety meanings, um, or we go into polarizing meanings. So one of the ways we do this is that we move into more masculine and feminine roles. So even if in the light of day, we're rather androgynous, we have masculine and feminine tendencies, each of us, that in sexuality, we'll move into more archetypal positions because it creates more tension between the poles. And so for some reason, this movement into discrepancy is a part of psych psychological stimulation. For, so for example, masculine or yang is like goal directed more assertive feminine is more receptive warmer uh more about surrender and you don't have to do feminine as a female or masculine as a male even in heterosexual couples but couples will tend to move it you know dominatrix is like a more masculine position a dominant position even though feminine so, so we, we move into these polarized positions. And so I have women who are like, oh my gosh, like why do I like this surrender, this sort of helpless position in sex when I would never be okay with that in the regular day-to-day -day of my life? And it's because we, we like moving into these kind of extreme identities. It's very similar with kids um, that are playing uh, as they're, they're taking on archetypal identities that are in juxtaposition, teacher, student, cop, robber, and they're trying on these polarized identities. And it's part of sorting out what it means to be human. It's part of trying on different ways of thinking. It's a way of understanding our social world. And we do this in sexuality too, or many of us do. Now, not, okay, so two thoughts. One is that if a child's pretending to be a bad guy, it's not because he wants to grow up and be a bad guy, okay? Or, nor that he wants to be a cop for that matter if he's playing that role. It's just a way of, again, trying on these things. That's why we do pretend and make believe play of all sorts. And so sexual fantasy can 
um, be a way of trying on aspects of ourselves and bringing this kind of vulnerable self into connection with a spouse. And I'm going to talk about when fantasy can be used in good ways and when it can be used in negative ways, because there we certainly can use it um, in a destructive way. You don't have to use fantasy to be sexual. So there's kind of three meaning frames in which people can engage their sexuality. The first is just, you know, that romantic or partner engagement meaning frame. I love you. You love me. I choose you. You choose me. We're kind of the only two people in the world right now. It's highly romantic, highly focused on gratitude and um, recognition of the preciousness of the partnership and of the relationship. Uh, so that's meaning frame number one. And I think that's maybe what many of us think is the, the most righteous meaning frame. I, I don't see it that simple mindedly, but that's a wonderful meaning frame. The second one is just um, like sensation focus. So there's been treatment approaches to helping couples to get better at focusing on the sensation they're receiving, the sensation they're giving. It's more about just focusing on the physical pleasure of sex. Okay. And that can be a very good and very important part of sex. Um, you know, I have a friend who was, I was talking to you about this and she said, I never fantasize. And, and I said, do you ever think about anything, you know, other than your spouse or, or the sensation? And she said, well, I think about nature sometimes. And I'm like, wow, that you're like way more righteous than me. <laughs> like, I don't think nature would do it for me. But, you know, so there's some people that are very normal, very healthy, that never are thinking in the realm of, you know, storylines or narratives. The, so the third one, then, of course, is about storylines or, or meanings that create more desire for you. And one of the things I do in my Art of Desire workshop or the course is I am talking to people about what are the meanings that make them desire sex? What are the meaning frames either in their relationship or within themselves that make sex appealing? A lot of times fantasy is pulling for those meaning frames. It's a way of making it more immediately available to your mind. For example, I like the meaning that I am chosen, that I am special, that, you know, my husband chooses me above all other options. Okay, that's like a meaning frame that a lot of women like, in part because I think we've been taught that male sexuality is indiscriminate. And so the idea that he chooses me, now this is also in a lot of romantic fiction, is that the guy in town that's capable and strong and even somewhat stoic is really in love with this one woman. He knows her. He values her. He desires her. That's the stuff that really good romantic fiction is made up of, is that she's chosen. So women will often use narratives in their minds of being chosen, of being special, that you're the woman that's wanted, um, that they'll break rules, in fact, to be with you, right? That um, they will go against convention. That's how desirable you are, is they'll break rules to be with you. It's also a way of getting out of the meaning frame of you should have sex because you're married. Nothing kills sexual desire faster than the idea that you're obligated or that you have to, or this is now your marital duty. A lot of people have been taught to think that way in marital sex and are surprised that that's 100% undesirable for them. We want to feel free in sexuality. We don't want to feel obligated or weighed down. And so one quick way to get to a sense of freedom is the fantasy or the idea that what you're doing is not righteous, not acceptable. So some, you know, so I know I've done this, which is that you, you turn your relationship into something more illicit, like premarital, we're dating, we should have stopped, we didn't stop, you know, now we have to, you know whatever, go repent, <laughs> but like turning it into a forbidden. And a lot of people like this. So I've told this story before where I'm lying next to my husband and he's touching me and I, you know, I'm becoming physiologically aroused, but I need to move psychologically in this direction that, you know, 
one of many scripts that I might know to engage is for myself is to say, you know, I really should get going. Like the introduction of the idea that this is forbidden. And John knows his line, which <laughs> no, just stay a few more minutes, like five more minutes and then I'll, I won't touch anything I'm not supposed to touch. <laughs> okay, well, of course, that's the whole dance of that you're doing what you shouldn't in this, you know, as opposed to it's Thursday night, you, it's been four days, you really should, okay, very unsexy. So you put it in the frame of, of choice and freedom, freedom because it's illegal. So if you're doing it, you know it's 100% your choice, okay, that kind of idea. Fantasy is about bringing in meanings that are sexually desirable to you. Now, probably most people can get their head around, well, maybe not, but you know, the idea that you're turning this into with your spouse, just premarital. Now, some might say like, well, that's still not righteous, is it? I mean, did you really, do you really wanna have premarital sex? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think that you, what you're thinking in sexuality is in fact an indication of what you would want in the light of day. It doesn't mean that you want it necessarily at all. Um, I think there's this idea out there that sex is always a slippery slope so don't let yourself think things, don't let yourself want things, because next thing you know, you'll be inviting the neighbors. I just don't think that's true. I mean, I, I think there's a difference. Now, there, there could be people that are using fantasy. Uh, they really do want to invite the neighbors, and they're starting with the fantasy of let's just pretend we're inviting the neighbors. But they really um, are functioning in a way that that's consistent with what they desire. But it's not because the, the camel's nose got in the tent, in my opinion, because you can either be using fantasy to create a certain kind of friendship and connection, or you can be using it to escape that or create something else. We have this idea that sexuality controls us as opposed to how are we relating to ourselves and the person we love through our sexuality? What's the meaning we're creating in what we're doing? So I would never say that fantasy is inherently good, nor would I say it's inherently bad. It, it depends on what the meaning is in the couple and what the impact is on the couple. And so you have to really filter it through that lens. This, you know, to be able to share my weirdness with my spouse and vice versa and find welcome there and to find, you know, partnership there, that's, that's, very special. It's very, um, that's a very meaningful part of my life to have that kind of acceptance and freedom with my spouse. And so it's not about, so, so the impact is, is positive. It's creating something stronger. It's creating a place to be deeply human and find, um, the ability to be knowable and to know myself, to know him, to be known to him. That's a really a sacred and wonderful thing. And I would never want any fantasy to destroy that, right? Or any kind of sexual idea to destroy that because that's way more precious than any particular idea. So this person says, I recently visited a urologist because it takes me roughly an hour or more to get stimulated enough to orgasm. It hurts my wife. And we are trying different things to try and speed up the process. My concern is that I feel like I have to fantasize or otherwise I can't have an orgasm. I feel so guilty because of it, but I want your opinion on fantasizing while doing sex. My urologist says it's okay, but I don't think he's a religious person. His opinion is not based on church standards. Is it okay? Is it against the church to fantasize during sex? If you have this problem, what has helped you? Yeah, I, I do think a lot of people think of it as a problem or they think of it as this is somehow aberrant to do this. And, um, you know, I think it is, first of all, it's, it's extremely normal and lots of good people do exactly this because it's just enough tension. You know, a lot of people might even be deeply engaged with their spouse, lots of eye contact, lots of like meaning, lots of gratitude in the sexual engagement. But when it comes to really getting to that orgasm threshold, they'll go into an idea that they know kind of builds the tension they need. It is a form of breaking contact in a way because you're moving into an idea that you may not necessarily be sharing, they may not be privy to or participating in. 
but it's not a kind of disconnection that pulls the couple apart. In fact, you know, the best and happiest couples are able to belong to themselves and their thoughts and be with each other. They're not trying to hide who they are. They're not trying to get away from the other person. They just can move into their mind without it threatening the connection or threatening the relationship. And some people just need that extra kick of stimulation psychologically to move over that orgasm threshold. Or sometimes they need it and sometimes they don't need it, but it's not, it, I don't see that as a limitation or something is wrong if that's in fact where you go. Again, it's this issue of being knowable. If you're hiding, that's different, okay? If you're using your spouse as a sex toy, so to speak, to do what you want to do in your head, and it's solipsistic, it's not about being with them, well, yeah, that's, that's a different meaning, and that's about using your spouse and staying away from them. But it's not defined by whether or not there's a sexual thought. I've kind of been growing out of this one, but one of my favorites has been this idea of that I'm a missionary, and John breaks into my uh, piso <laughs> to give me what I really need. <laughs> and so that's, you know, it's playing with a lot of ideas. It's illegal. It's breaking the rules. Um, he's, it's dominant. You know, he's in a kind of authoritative position. I'm in a more innocent and receptive position. And I'm not even choosing it because I'm a good missionary, <laughs> but it's being done to me. And so I can have the pleasure without having to kind of validate it myself, right? So a lot of women like that, you can surrender to the pleasure, surrender to the care, and you don't have to break any of the rules, you know? And so it's also this kind of meaning of, I think in my own life, there was sort of this meaning of like, is the church more important to men and sort of where they stand with each other? Or do they really value and partner with their wives or wives just kind of like the tag along, tag along to their larger project of being church leaders and all these things. And I think that was an idea that scared me that in getting married, I would just be the tag along to support all of his important work, but not be valued myself. So it's also taking this meaning of, you know, that I am desired above the specific rules that I'm chosen above any sort of deference to uh, obedience to the church, for example. So, you know, it's not like my mind's trying to think of some way to do this. It's like that idea appeals to me. What does it show me about myself? Because sometimes it can show as much like dream interpretation, something about the meanings that are there for us around sexuality. Um, now, some people would say like, well, that's, that's terrible that you want to break rules. It's terrible that you are acting all surrendery and passive <laughs> and people can have their own opinion, of course, and they obviously will have their own opinion, but I just don't see it that way. I think it's like a playing with masculine and feminine energy. It's a playing with dominance and surrender by two people who could choose otherwise, right? Abusive relationships, you're so much in a need for the validation of the other person that you don't feel you really have choices because you need someone else to sustain your sense of self. When okay, let's see. Um, I'm realizing that I need to actually verbally play out the fantasy on my, in my mind. How have you decided on a dialogue or do you allow it to play out naturally? Uh, yeah, pretty naturally. I mean, I'm not saying how couples should do this. Um, I think you can just play with it. You know, you just say the idea that you like, and then you maybe say a line or two, and then your spouse can say a line or two if they want, and you can just kind of co-create it. It doesn't have to go in a predetermined way. Uh, you know, sometimes couples will start in a little bit of interaction, but then maybe just more in their minds are playing it out. They don't have to stay in dialogue the whole time, but they kind of have a shared idea or a shared meaning they both like. I'm not here to say that it always has to be shared or always, you know, you have to be saying what's in your mind necessarily. Um, sometimes my spouse and I have kind of co constructed stories, erotic stories that we like that are about the two of us in different roles, in different time, in different circumstances, but we are kind of creating the story together. So one of us starts with an idea, and, and this isn't necessarily during sex, we could just even be like, you know, on the phone or something, thinking of something we like. And again, they're often pulling for the meanings that mean a lot to us. 
um, and or that we like. And so you're, and sometimes I'll be like, no, I'll, no, let's not have that happen. Let's have this. Happen. <laughs> so, you know, you still have to kind of collaborate and figure out how do we, how do we create something we both like? Um, and so you can do it deliberately in that way. And, you know, again, as I talked about in the sexuality course that you can come up with kind of like, you know, John and I kind of have our own like erotic file in a sense of pictures uh, of me and you know stuff things John has written to me stories we've written you know it's just kind of like a place we can go now you don't have to be so formal about it you don't have to do it at that level but it's intimate to do that you know that you're letting this person in on your weirdness um this person says I've not and written up 67 role plays I'm worried about what my wife of 17 years will think if I share with her She's awfully closed minded thoughts on ripping the bandaid off and just pass the options her way. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, this really gets down to how intimate a marriage can be. And I mean, it's one thing to share who you are. It's another thing to pressure your spouse, to share it with you, to want the same thing, to like the same thing, to start going into, if you loved me, you would do this thing. Uh, you know, so we can really go over the boundary. Um, and a lot of people that I work with who actually cannot validate their sexuality, men can like, for example, that are very high desire actually don't have peace about their sexuality. They feel defective and strange. And sometimes they want things that are strange even to them, but then they'll turn it into my wife is so frigid and strange and weird that she can't do this. So they kind of make the struggle be with her rather than with themselves. But back to the question of like, how do I let her in on who I am? Well, it takes a lot of courage because she may not like it. She may be overwhelmed. She may say, no, I don't want to be married to somebody who wants this kind of story. Uh, she may read it and be like, why have you been holding out on me all these years? <laughs> I, I do have couples like that where the husband or the wife finally shares something and it just like opens up a whole part of themselves they didn't even know was there until the other person kind of stuck their neck out and said, this appeals to me. You know, a, a lot of us have this idea that women just, a lot of men have been taught the idea that women aren't really that into sex, that we're all too fragile to handle it. And so the husband becomes a very tentative lover, a very tentative participant. Is this okay? Are you okay? Do you like this? Do you not like this? And is a lot of anxiety. It's caretaking, but it's not sexy. And it's not attractive because the woman can't surrender to the confidence of the man. She can't surrender to him owning who he is and what he feels. Now, I'm not here to say this means it's men's fault because women are often participating in undermining their husband's confidence on purpose. They're co-constructing a, an apologetic lover because then they don't have to deal with their own sexuality. Men or women will just claim what they feel, which is different than you have to give it to me. They just say, I like this idea. This appeals to me. This turns me on. And sometimes it's the confidence with which you claim your sexuality and you claim who you are, which is different than dominating. It's just the confidence in who you are, the lack of apology that gives you, the other person, the permission to show yourself as well. They're okay with who they are. Maybe I can be okay with who I am and let them in on it. They seem to be able to handle it, at least about themselves. And so we, you know, if we're looking too much for validation in the sexual realm, it will stay limited. It'll only revolve in the areas that you both have already determined you can handle as a couple. And that can really limit how creative and open and free it is. Again, people want freedom with sexuality. They don't want shoulds. They don't want rules. Because that's like, you shouldn't feel this way. You're having the wrong thoughts. That puts the, the deepest weight on sexuality. Now, by freedom, I don't mean freedom from morality. I do mean it's not moralistic, which is, can't believe you'd even think that, you know. I can't believe you even write that fantasy. That's moralistic. That's fear-based. That's shaming of sec our sexual nature as if it's something to do with the adversary as opposed to something to do with our humanity. 
having a moral anchor though is different, which is there's freedom by not a libertine view, like no matter what I think it's legitimate, like I'm not gonna do anything that will undermine our friendship or undermine my integrity. I won't do that. But that's not so much driven by fear as by clarity and direction and a kind of strong moral core about the kind of person you're gonna be. But accepting who you are as a sexual being and being at peace with your sexual nature is really fundamental to developing yourself morally, to developing yourself as a person capable of peace and acceptance of others as well as yourself. If someone needs to fantasize to go over the threshold of orgasm, to not necessarily share that fantasy with their spouse. Some fantasies that I have, I definitely share with my husband and others are just a space that I have to flip into my head to help me orgasm. And I get to hold those as my own. I do fully agree with that. Yes, exactly. It's, it's like, there's, it's a difference of like, I can't tell you, you can't handle it, right? That, that's a different idea than just, if I'm sure, my, I'm sure, I know my husband has thoughts that he's never shared with me, but I'm okay because I know who he is. I trust him. I don't need him to share every thought he's had with me because I, I know that he chooses me and loves me. Sometimes when I do share my fantasy, my spouse kind of turns into a high school boy, like he's over eager and then it kills it for me. So I'm hesitant to share. Well, you know, that might be something worth saying to him. Um, and also looking at yourself, what do I mean by that? He gets overly eager. Um, he wants to own it. He wants to claim it as his own. He wants to, you, you know, maybe just understanding what's happening. Am I a part of what's happening? Is there something about me that makes him get over eager or makes it easy for him to do that? Is that something I could talk to him about so that I felt like there's a little bit more freedom for me to claim my own thoughts with him without feeling like they're getting hijacked or taken away? Um, I've had a lot of women talk about that. Like if I just open the door a little, it's like my husband's and basically he loses his partnering position with me and now it's about him again. So it makes it really easy to not share who I am. And so it's really wise to talk about that. Um, you know, what do I do if I can't get my spouse to want to do the things I want to do? Um, and I, I, okay. So I think there's a real difference between I'm willing to let you know who I am and what I like. It's another thing to be upset and frustrated until you'll give me what I want. Because if you really want an intimate relationship, we'll find the places you can be together genuinely that you can both really be there, not just that your spouse will accommodate you with the least amount of disgust. I don't mean that. I mean, where you can really be as a couple because that's how you start to expand where you can both be together. But it's, I mean, just almost never has it been like some pouting, frustrated spouse that, that the lower desired person yields to that you create something shared. It becomes that sex is about doing favors or resisting the pressure of favors not about partnership. And so there's a lot of people that say they want sexual intimacy, but what they really want is just to have their desires and their sexuality validated by their spouse. And for her or him, if it is, you know, to kind of make their desires legitimate, which is developmentally immature as opposed to, okay, my spouse doesn't like this fantasy. It doesn't do anything for her. Okay, can I just be grown up enough to be more flexible. I've, I've seen people get really fetishistic about certain ideas. If you don't like this, like I'm never going to be happy. I can't live my life unless we can do A, B, and C. And that's, that's over the top immature in my not humble opinion. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, I'm going to sacrifice friendship so that some idea that I've, I've made everything gets fulfilled by you. That's just giving up too much of your uh, ability to run your life and your sense of self. And it's an expression of your difficulty partnering. I also think it's immature to get in a moralistic position. I can't believe you'd even think that. How dare you write that story or want this thing? Because you're anxious about sexuality. And so you just can like, you know, shame your spouse. That's also immature, right? So there's a kind of like, I'm at least willing to think about what it means for you. What do you like about that idea? Um, 
like as a way of knowing your spouse and being able to really make a decision. And I think this is inherent to marriage in general to really make a decision about, is this, can I join my spouse and can I try it? Can I, can we tweak it in some way so that it's more something that I could also like, right? That you're really operating as partners and you're doing your half of partnering, which is not just going to be pressuring and it's not going to be just yielding. It's about, well, no, I, I do want to understand and know you in this way, but I don't know that I can join you in that way, but maybe we could do this, right? And again, um, I think Schnarch writes about this in Passionate Marriage, but just this idea of you, you can belong to yourselves and have your, your unique ways of doing things, but can we find a way, pl places and ways to really be with one another and to be flexible enough to find that? And that's a two-way street of flexibility. And I, in my experience, the couples that learn how to bring their best to one another can then go to other places because they trust that the friendship and the partnership is operating in the marriage. So there's more room to say, well, that's appealing to you. I, you know, let's, let's try that because I trust that we're friends that I'm just not there to accommodate your obsessive interest, for example. For me, fantasy ideas feel different than role playing with my partner. Uh, yeah, I think that is different. So one's just about kind of pulling your mind somewhere that's a favorite. Uh, so one is pulling, pulling your mind to an idea that's, that's um, helps you get over the orgasm threshold. It's more in your own mind. And another is creating that between you. We are, always like making sure the only thing that we show is what we both know we can already accommodate. You know, you, um, Dr. Schnarch talked about it is that it becomes a couple of leftovers and we're all sort of doing that. Like, where can we find agreement? Um, but I always get worried when people think like my ideas are higher than my spouse's. So I'm more advanced because I can come up with more ideas and that's not necessarily more advanced because a lot of people prefer, you know, accommodate whatever things in my head over, I really know how to partner and be with you and know you in the intimacy of sex, right? That, and so I've had clients who say things like, you know, when she gets to my level, it's like, well, I don't know if a wise woman would want to get to your level <laughs> because it, it's more about reinforcement of you than it is about how to really be able to love through your sexuality and really know your spouse through your sexuality. And when couples learn how to really do that, well, then there's a lot more freedom to go places together. Do you worry about your kids discovering your fantasy files at some point in time? <laughs> well, they're not like files in the office. They're like under electronic lock and key and uh, encrypted and so on. So we've done our, our very well best to keep our kids from having to be grossed out like that. <laughs> But, you know, if our kids knew it existed someday, oh, sure, that's, that's a good thing for them, probably, because um, they don't have to enjoy the idea of their parents having sex. But it does, I mean, I do think a great advantage for me in my life was I could tell that my, my mom liked being touched by my dad. My mom, I could tell, she never said it, and she wasn't particularly good at educating me about sexuality, but I could tell that she... Um, liked it, didn't resist it. And that was just, that was a gift to me because I think it allowed me to make it legitimate in me, even though I was sometimes hearing delegitimizing ideas at church and so on. Person says, can we talk about fantasy, like really embarrassing fantasy, threesomes, orgies? I'm an LDS woman married 15 years, just discovered fantasy, and I'm having trouble orgasming without some sort of explicit fantasy narrative. Some of them have been really quite telling about how I feel about sexuality on a psychological level, and I've found that helpful. My partner loves it because we share them with each other, and I would say it's very positive when we're together. But I feel kind of fearful the next day, like like what are you like you are what you think kind of thing. Can this really be healthy? Does imagining these types of scenarios ever lead to people wanting this in real life? I don't want to go down that path. I don't want my husband to think I'm comfortable going down that path. I know JFF says we always have choices and we have to trust our future selves in those choices, but is this a slippery slope? So again, 
yes to everything. <laughs> I mean, really, I think this person does get it, but is maybe just trying to get her head around it. You know, I, I think we are often taught the idea of a God that doesn't think much of sex, uh, that wants, you know, this kind of um, super ego way of relating in the world rather than an integrated self a self that's capable of pleasure and joy while continuing to be a moral being that can be quirky and weird sometimes, but doesn't let that undermine their core moral relational frame, right? I never want anything in my life to break my responsibility to the people I love because it would be very bad for them, but it would be very bad for me too because if I don't live up to that in me, it will crush me. So there is no sexual pleasure that's worth breaking that basic um, collaborative position I hold with the people that are most dear to me. So when you lead with that, that becomes the moral anchor. And, you know, there's ideas that come into my mind that I say, oh, I'm not going to go there. I don't, I don't want to go there. I don't need to go there. And I don't, I can choose a different path. Um, and I think that's valuable to really see yourself as the chooser and the decider so that you're not um, compromising your fundamental relationships and your relationship to your own integrity. That's There is no sexual uh, position or perspective or choice that's worth throwing away those things that are far more precious. But the, these can be a way to enhance those relationships. What's the difference between setting boundaries versus not being open-minded? Um, I feel like I have a boundary about something sexual. My husband loves to imagine me being pleased by another man or, both, or by both of them. He doesn't want another woman in the fantasy and he doesn't want to interact with the other man. It's pure, purely about pleasing me. I don't feel comfortable with that yet or maybe never. I'm very monogamous partly because of our culture and also just who I am. Nothing wrong with people who are turned on by that. It's just not something I'm into. My husband feels like I'm being closed-minded and that he can't be comfortable sharing his fantasies and certain desires. While I don't want him to feel like he can't be open with me or enjoy his fantasies with me, some stuff I'm just not ready for might even be, might even be a hard no for me. How do I share my boundary without feeling like I'm shutting him down? How can I help him feel more at peace with not wanting to participate in his fantasies I'm not into? Okay, so I have maybe three thoughts about that. So the first one is that, you know, sometimes just understanding a little bit better what's the meaning behind that fantasy. Now, I, I relate to that very monogamous thing. I am also even in my fantasies. Like, I, I just, I am. Um, I think that though that sometimes when people have that, it's not that they really want their spouse to be with someone else. It's a little bit like this reminder that they don't own their spouse, that their spouse could be desirable to another person, that there's this kind of, it, it's creating this tension of not being able to have the person. It's like breaking the idea that you're entitled to your spouse. It's breaking the idea that they belong to you. And so for a lot of people, when that idea is in their mind, it's desirable. Like I remember once when I was sitting in Relief Society, John came to hand me the car keys, but the way our Relief Society is you have to come in at the front of the room. And so he was in a suit, always sexy, <laughs> walked in the door and, you know, other people noticed him before I did. I look and I see him, he looks so handsome. And there's just this moment, like all these women are looking at him and I'm just I was thinking like, that's my husband. Like I other people can see his attractiveness and yet you know he's the person i get to go home with so that's just this idea of like breaking any idea of you're in my back pocket that i just you know you have to uh have sex with me because you're my spouse idea it makes them a man and a woman again separate so that could be part of what's going on with your spouse around this it's just like a fantasy that kind of turns it back into you're a woman fundamentally and I don't own you. Um, that said, you don't need to feel comfortable with it and you don't have to say, okay, I like that idea too. And that isn't, and you could shame your spouse. Some people do handle their 
not liking something by shaming, but you could just say, I, it's not an idea that appeals to me, but it is your husband's responsibility to handle his own ideas without needing you to validate them through wanting them also. And this, because sexuality is such a vulnerable stuff, it's really hard, I think, sometimes to stay clear about this. You know, like the person I was referencing earlier who has a lot of sexual anxieties and pressures his spouse so much is that he sees her as the one who will reconcile his own doubts about himself and his sexual desires. So he puts all the pressure on her rather than, okay, you know, my spouse doesn't like that idea, but I can be okay with it in me. I can, I can be disappointed, but where can I be with her? And that's just the responsibility of grown up love is to handle your disappointments um, and to still stay collaborative, to stay in partnership and create something good through your honest exposure of who you are. A lot of us get confused that if you, we show who we are, that's inherently to pressure, which it isn't, or that if you're not going to pressure, you have to hide. Or like in this question, I think you can show where you stand, why you like it or don't like it. And your husband may be disappointed, but that's inherent to marriage. That doesn't mean that you need to go over and make him feel comfortable. That's more on him. If you're shaming him, different. But if you're just saying, I don't like it for these reasons, or it feels you know, unappealing because I just, my mind goes to more monogamous fantasies, but, um, but I can handle if it, you like thinking that way when you're with me because that feels appealing to you, but I probably won't join you in it because it doesn't do anything for me. I think that's part of a grown-up understanding of two different people. How does one help their spouse feel more comfortable in acting out fantasy? She's more than willing to participate but feels guilty after the fact. Um, yeah, I think I would just... I'm just trying to get is there any role that you play in it. I mean, I, I think just being open to understanding your wife and and not trying to change her as much as understand her. Like, what do you think makes you feel guilty after the fact? Do you think it's undermining you spiritually? If so, in what way does it, you know, is it possible that you need your understanding of God to shift a bit or your understanding of goodness to shift. I know for me, I'm just imagining what you might be saying. You know, I know for me that it makes me feel close to you. It makes me feel grateful for what we have, you know, in a way, just allowing your, because I think a lot of us have been taught certain ideas about morality and sexuality. And as we're, as we're kind of shifting in those positions, it can be unclear, like, is this good or is this not good? It's by their fruits, ye shall know them. Like I'm trying to make sense of, it seems to be good, but it's counter to everything that I've learned. And so am I missing something? That's not unusual at all for people to like the next day be like, wait a minute, am I doing something that's working against my spirituality? How can you get to a place where you can share the more taboo fantasies when your spouse wants to make them real afterwards, even though it, it isn't something I'm willing to do? It's way easier to just not share them and it kind of kills the mood when he's all, will you actually do that with me? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you have to work out that fact. I mean, to say like, I don't like sharing things with you, not because I can't validate what I like, but I don't like sharing it with you because then you turn it into what you want it to be. And then I feel like I'm just imagining that I have to then manage and sort of push back on that all the time. So I'd rather not share. Now, I'm not saying you're saying it punishingly. I'm, you're saying it like you're this pressure. I'm assuming this is true from what you're saying, that this pressure is a way of sort of taking it and running with it as opposed to staying with me and something we can share and create together. And I don't want to make it real. I mean, if you don't. And so can you just, I can acknowledge you want that, but can we do something that we can both be comfortable with? How do you open a conversation about fantasy? Okay, this is to go back to the other person's question. I'm pretty into it, but I feel like my husband would just think I'm weird if I talk about it. Well, he, he might think you're weird, you know? It's possible that it will challenge his understanding of you. But again, that's the part of 
relationships and sexuality that's the scary part which is am i willing to let you know who i am can i validate myself enough to tolerate you knowing more about me uh, even if you do think it's weird even if you don't like it and he may not right but again it's back to can i that might be disappointing that might be hard he may not want or at least not now you know but maybe later um you know there were things my husband said to me in the first year of marriage where i'm like ah you know no like <laughs> and i wanted like my, my my fear i just wanted something more rigid i think and um but then as i grew in my trust in the relationship and in the partnership and in how meaningful the sexuality was that it made me more able to say like i really can you know I don't need to be rigid like that. I like you, I trust you, and we can do more things together. Uh, that enhance the two of us, right? This person says, my husband told me that pretty much every woman he meets, he imagines naked and imagines what sex with her would be like. I understand that sexual fantasies are normal, but going to this extent really hurts me. I try to focus my sexual thoughts and feelings towards my husband. I think it's one thing to notice if someone's pretty. It's a completely different thing to imagine having sex with her. He has also tried to incorporate other people we know, including some of my family members into sexual fantasies together. It really throws a damper on things for me when he does this. Then throw in the porn use and you have a wife who feels like her husband desires to be with anyone but her, you know, or you have an indulgent husband, I would say. I'm not good with this. It really hurts my feelings and makes me not trust him. I don't know what I can say to help him understand why these things are hurtful to me. I just want to be desired by him, but his desires for everyone except me leave me feeling alone and sad. I think he's on a road to try and make things right with me, but I don't even know how he could make something like this right. What actions could he take? How do I stop feeling the way I do about all the things he's done? Yeah, so again, this is just based on what's written there. Maybe if I knew more about this, I would have a different view, but it, it feels like you have an indulgent husband. So by indulgent, I mean that he's kind of saying, because I think it, I get to say it, I get to dwell on it, I get to uh, get lost in it. And so this is where fantasy can be problematic, is if you're using it as a way to get away from life, to indulge every thought and feeling you have, that it takes on a life of its own. And when you say you don't trust, it's because it's not trustworthy behavior. It's being driven by what one feels in any moment, not by a kind of moral compass. Now, again, I'm not talking about a rigid, moralistic, you can't think anything, but that, that again, it's, it's a, the absence of a moral anchor here. And I mean, I think even just this, that he has told me that pretty much every woman he meets, he imagines naked and you know, first of all, that there's the fact of doing that to every woman you meet. I mean, it's it, there's a fundamental disrespect in it. And then another thing to tell your wife that you're doing that with every woman, there's a fundamental disrespect towards her. So the issue is the indulgence and the disrespect that's inherent to the way he's orienting to his sexuality. And a lot of people who, you know, have, you know, strong feelings about their spouse being addicted to porn and they see it that way, a lot of times what they're speaking to is that they're tracking a very real kind of um, disrespectful indulgence in the way the spouse orients to the marriage and to every desire they have. And they're right. I mean, they're, they're saying like, I, th there's something about this that is um, self-focused in the worst sense, you know, indulgent, and not about partnering. It's about, you know, you exist for me and women exist for me and, and you should be doing what makes me comfortable. Otherwise you're frigid. And to not like that is wise. It's good judgment. So if we're using fantasy to escape our life, to escape our marriage, to escape ourselves, um, that's problematic, always will be. Um, if we're using it to know ourselves, to play with our spouse, to you know, engage in a kind of meaningful sexual relationship, then it can be good. So you have to really look at what is this creating between us? What is this creating in me? Is my anxiety about it, about just kind of early rigid ideas or is my anxiety about it 
that it does feel destructive. It does feel disrespectful. It feels like we're something's eroding that uh, I don't feel good about. And, and that's very important to really track the difference. I think we like a world in which there's behavioral definitions that we can always depend on, like, you know, oral sex is bad and missionary position is good. Of course, that's not true because a lot of cruel, horrible things can happen in missionary position and a lot of beautiful things can happen in missionary position. It's what's in your heart finds it. What are you creating that defines it? So I do know, I do know that um, these are hard topics. They are. It, it, that's why it's hard to find meaningful conversation or even help around sexuality, even in like marriage and family therapy programs. They for years would have nothing on sexuality for counselors training to work with couples. And it's, so it's not just a Latter-day Saint thing. It's a anxiety about sex specifically because sexual thought can be so unruly and strange. And so being wise about how we orient to some of these aspects of hu our humanity, that we, we use it to accept ourselves, but to stay on a course of creating meaningful, rich, honest, respectful relationships fundamentally. Um, that make room for some of our weirdness, but don't use our weirdness to obliterate or harm or indulge. That's the challenge. And I think, you know, we're tempted to turn it into something black and white and easy. Um, but that's not to say that you can't discern and make good decisions for yourself on this front and continue to forge an intimate relationship through your honest uh, engagement around these questions and with each other. So thanks everybody. Um, and I, let me see, I will just say this. Um, so the room for two podcasts that we've been doing for a couple months now, I think we just put up our ninth or 10th episode, uh, is awesome. Not to brag. <laughs> um, people start coming after Christy with pitchforks on Thursdays. So if she hasn't released the next episode because <laughs> people really are liking it a lot. So I highly recommend you get on there and subscribe if you haven't already because our introductory pricing is going up on Monday. So it's your chance <laughs> to get in now. Um, you get to listen to me work with couples around their intimate relationship, around their sexual, you know, their emotional intimacy, their sexual intimacy, and hear my feedback. And a lot of people have been writing us and saying that this is really helping them to apply some of the principles that I teach to the more practically to understand what it translates into within the marriage because they can see themselves in these marriage uh, in these couples that are uh, courageously and willingly sharing their stories with us. So anyway, so I hope you'll check out the podcast and I will see you all next month. Okay. Bye everybody.